Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. John's. Uh, Live each day like it is your last. You've probably heard advice similar to that. You only live once, something along those lines. Um, It's a a great idea, great advice sometimes to take advantage of the the time that you have. Uh, But that advice can also be backwards. Uh, Because the reality is, thanks to Jesus, we have an unending amount of time. Uh, That's why our new sermon series is entitled, Live Like You'll Live Forever. Um, And today, especially, we're going to see how, because we can live forever in the perfection with with Jesus, um, we can also live now in courageous witness. Um, In other words, we don't need to be afraid of sharing the good news about Jesus. And we'll unpack more of that in our service today. Um, Everything can be found up on the screens and in our service folders. Um, If you don't mind just taking a minute to fill out a Connect card, that'd be great. And you can put that into the offering plate when that time comes. Um, And as you probably are noticing, we have a special service today as we celebrate Reformation. Five hundred one years ago, in 1523... A mere six years after the posting of the 95 Theses, Martin Luther was committed to providing a German language hymnal for the people to use in worship. After collaborating with gifted poets who shared his fervor for singing the truths of God's word, Luther's work led to the publication of the first Lutheran hymnal in 1524, for which we now mark the 500th anniversary. Today we also celebrate the Reformation of the Christian Church, which Martin Luther set into motion on October 31st, 1517. Luther's Reformation brought back into the church the teachings and doctrines that are true to God's word, which the church at the time had distorted and perverted. A cherished byproduct of this Reformation was and is Lutheran hymns. Martin Luther strongly believed that anyone attending worship should be able to participate, which was not the practice at the time, and should be able to do so in their native language, as opposed to Latin. Thus, he encouraged the singing of Christian poetry. And so it is only fitting that we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the first Lutheran hymnal on our observance of Reformation. Many of the hymns today date back to the time of Luther, and some are newer. But all of our hymns today not only celebrate our Lutheran heritage, but are also tied to the truths of the Reformation, that we are saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, as taught in God's word alone. Many of you may know that our closing hymn, A Mighty Fortress, is referred to as the Battle Hymn of the Reformation. Similarly, our opening hymn today, Salvation Unto Us Has Come, which appeared in the first Lutheran hymnal, is referred to as the true confessional hymn of the Lutheran Church. Please join me and Christians throughout the world and throughout time as we celebrate our great heritage of singing hymns. Please stand. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, as we make our confession, we use words of a confessional hymn text based on Psalm 130, written by Martin Luther. In confidence, let us come before our gracious Lord to confess our sins and to receive his gracious absolution. We speak the words of the psalm and then sing some of the stanzas penned by the great reformer. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. God has promised his forgiveness of sins to those who confess their sins in repentance, seeking his grace and mercy for the sake of his beloved son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. may be seated. The first reading comes from Daniel chapter 3. This also serves as the basis for our message this morning. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. This is the word of the Lord.
Our second reading comes from Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Um, here, St. John sees God's messenger proclaiming the true gospel to all people. And then in 1546, this reading also served as the text for the funeral of Martin Luther. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord.
Please stand. Our gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 5 to 11. And here Jesus speaks to his disciples, uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And as he speaks to them, he encourages and empowers all of us that we might be bold in sharing the gospel in these end times. Jesus said to his disciples, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, King Nebuchadnezzar laid siege on Judah again and again, bringing captives back to Babylon. In 586 BC, he officially destroyed Jerusalem. All of the people to work for, I mean, of all the people to work for this crazy king, Nebuchadnezzar, were Daniel and his friends. And yet, they were good, hardworking, and believing people who still worked for him. But right before our section, this crazy king Nebuchadnezzar builds this statue. There's a good chance that this statue was a statue of the Babylonian city god Marduk, which is a great name. Um, according to tradition, Marduk fights another goddess, kills her, cuts her body in two, <laughs> use one body or one part of the body to create the earth and the other part of the body to create the heavens, which is just like a great nighttime story, bedtime story for your kids. And then Marduk goes on and creates human beings and manages the other kind of lesser deities and gods, effectively becoming the god of gods. And then the statue was about 90 feet tall. Um, this last week, uh, Alex Alante and I tried to measure it out in here. Uh, 90 feet is about from those, those first doors that are, are open right now to about the altar. So that's about 90 feet. That's a large statue that Nebuchadnezzar wanted all people to bow down and worship. So if this city god, this city statue was Marduk, you can understand then why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had an issue bowing down to a false god that people claimed was the creator of the world and the god of gods. Titles reserved for the true God. Because Daniel and these three men knew the truth and even had experience with the true God. And then when they refuse, Nebuchadnezzar is furious, brings them in, threatens them with this fiery furnace. And then we hear this question, which is the first verse of our text. What God will be able to rescue you from my hand? I want to look at that question today, a question that we could just shorten with this, just saying, who is your God? It's an important question with an answer that I'd like to lead up to first. And I'm going to do something crazy. Normally pastors give like one or two points in a sermon. I'm giving six today. Let's do this. As the... As the theme of our day implied, living a, a Christian life of courageous witness is not just about witnessing, but it's about how we live our lives. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, my wife Julie and I were able to, to visit Joshua Tree National Park, not once, but twice. Um, once during the 100 degree daytime and then also at nighttime, uh, Joshua Tree is known for its stargazing. It's a dark sky park. And I even tried my hand at photography, which I know it's going to be really hard in the, the, the daytime here, but you can still somewhat see the tree, maybe a little bit better on that side. Um, but what you notice is that we are miles away from another town. And even though this park is located a, a few thousand um, yards and, and feet above the nearest town, maybe you'll be able to see us. But I don't know if you can see on the, on the horizon, there's still light pollution. Just, just crazy to me to think about. Um, it reminded me of that, that childhood song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. Just to think that in the darkness of this world, a little light stands out. Now, we often think that our witnessing is only telling someone about Jesus. But this is a reminder that there is a whole life of letting our light shine that can lead up to a spiritual conversation about Jesus. Where can we learn 
to shine the light of Jesus in a world that is dark? Or how can we stand up for Jesus when the world bows down? Because there is always pressure to bow down to the things our culture or even our own city bows down to. We don't necessarily construct a 90-foot statue in these parts of town. But we have things that we construct in our own lives that we worship, that we prioritize over God. And they have become so normalized that we find ourselves bowing down to them like all the other Israelites were doing and not even realizing it. For example, at this time of year, it's pretty normal for our culture to bow down to politics. Maybe drinking culture is our city god. Or we see how sexuality and abuse are often normalized. Or maybe it's the idea of being rich and famous that we bow down to. Everyone wants to be a social media influencer. Or maybe it's kind of all of the above. I mean, have you seen in the news what's going on with P. Diddy lately? Like, think of all the people who wanted to go to these big fancy parties with P. Diddy. Like, all these people who went and said nothing, normalizing it. Because everyone bows down to these rich and famous ideas, and then they become normalized even among us. Like a spoon in coffee. Yeah. Have you ever heard that before? Like, supposedly to, to cool your coffee down, you can just put a metal spoon in your coffee, and it's just kind of simple physics. The, the spoon takes on the heat, and then you take the spoon out. But the spoon is still hot, which kind of reminds me that in the same way, when we are left in our world, it's very easy for us to take on the heat, to take on the bad qualities of what's around us. They become normal. How can we stand up when it is so easy to bow down to anything but God? To live a life of courageous witness implies you need courage. And courage implies that we will sometimes face difficult situations, maybe even scary. Living courageously for God means giving up the priorities and the mindsets that we hold so dearly. We're often scared to give up our idols because they have become a part of us. And we're scared that if we give them up, people will think less of us. People will think differently about us. Or you're scared that you'll maybe lose the friends who maybe don't even realize that they have the same problem. We're scared of what we have to give up. But God allows these moments to show us that we all worship something. You either bow down to him or to something else. You can't serve two masters. And what these three men reminded us today is that there is more at risk than our social life or even our physical life. That our spiritual and eternal life are at risk if we continue to bow down to these idols simply because that's what we want or because everyone else is doing it. And there are times that, that we must risk unraveling the life we have in order to see the life that God wants for us. That leads to our fourth and quick principle that we can stand together when the world is bowing down. It's difficult to stand up for God and to stand up for Christian living when you're alone, when you're by yourself. But having a fellow Christian to stand up with makes all the difference. Maybe it isn't even physically standing up. Maybe it's just sitting down with a Christian friend who just, just lost their spouse and is struggling with any kind of hope. Or texting that one Christian friend who has the same struggles that you do so that you can pray for each other in that struggle. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also reminded us that it is much easier to be courageous in Christian living when you have a reason to be courageous. 
1997, during the Masters Tournament, Tiger Woods had built up such a commanding lead by the final round that he essentially had the victory before even stepping onto the course Sunday morning. And knowing that, he was able to play some of his best golf. It's easier to be courageous when you know you have the victory. Or I think about Martin Luther. Because he stood up for the truth of the Bible during a time that bowed down to the church and to church leaders, his life was in constant danger. But Luther's faith was, and even his determination, were not shaken because his victory was not in arguments or trying to find righteousness in being a good person, but through Christ alone, through grace alone, and through God's word alone in the Bible. Martin Luther knew, just like you and I know, that because God wins, we win. God is the Lord of all creation. He is our Savior. And no other God saves the way that God saves. He didn't put up a 90-foot statue, but he erected a cross. Jesus not only went through literal fire for us, but endured the fires of hell so that Satan cannot harm us. God tears down those idols in our hearts and lives with the good news about Jesus and forgiveness. And whenever guilt tries to set up a new structure in our heart, we are reminded that we have refuge and hope and victory in God. We find victory in Jesus. And we can live for God as difficult as it is. Because life with him is so much better than what life can even attempt to offer. It's easier to be courageous when we remember that our God is someone who loves us and has our eternal good in mind. And so as we courageously live for God, God gives us opportunities to share this message in ways we never thought possible. I don't think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego kind of woke up in the morning and thought, you know, I'm going to share God's word in this kind of fun way. <laughs> no, it, they never dreamed it would happen that way. But because they lived differently, it provided a crazy way to witness. And in the same way, there are important spiritual reasons why God calls us to live for him. To not bow down to the idols that we construct. But another big reason is because your light shining in the darkness of this world may lead to the one conversation where someone asks you, who is your God that you live like this? We can preach that word and witness in our own unique way with our own unique, unique gifts. In fact, this last week in school, we watched the Kids Connection, which is like a Wells Connection for kids. And we heard about this, this young man, a first grader who writes hymns. Like, how amazing is that? In doing so, he is telling people about Jesus in his own way. The beauty uh, about music in our hymnal is that we can learn profound truths about our God and sing them in ways that even a four-year-old can know and understand. And for 500 years, the Lutheran hymnal has preached the good news through music that regardless of what may happen to us, our God is an awesome God and that he has already given us the victory. So, who is your God? It's an important question because how you answer that will define your identity and how you live your life. And answering it, it will provide you with opportunities you, opportunities you never thought possible to tell someone about the God who saves. Amen.
The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. You may be seated. We pray. Gracious God, in mercy you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to redeem us from sin and rescue us from hell. Through your scriptures and by your Spirit, you have brought us to faith in your Son and assured us that Christ has fully completed the work of our salvation. In the face of immense pressure to compromise their confession, you emboldened Martin Luther and the Lutheran reformers to take a firm stand on the truths of Scripture. Through their clear confession of faith, you restored the gospel to your church and preserved the saving truth among us today. Use our confession to bring faith in your Son to the hearts of those who do not yet believe in you. Eternal God, you have promised to preserve and protect your church in every age. Bless all who face hardships for their faith with an added measure of your spirit, so that they do not lose heart as they bear their crosses. Today we also ask that you please be with Gail Breitenfeld, who recently broke her wrist. Comfort the sick and suffering, the depressed and lonely, those who are persecuted and ridiculed for their faith, and all others who need the encouragement of your love. Fix our eyes on the cross of your Son, his empty tomb, and the sure promise of eternal life in heaven's glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we continue with the offering. You can also place your Connect card into the offering plate at this time.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should give thanks to you, Almighty Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For you have kept your word and kept your people in your word, so that the gates of hell will not prevail, nor your gospel be silenced by error or deceit. Knowing you as both just and justifier, we join our voices with all the faithful who have gone before us, with your church throughout the world, and with the hosts of heaven, as we praise your holy name and sing the glorious song. Blessed are you, Lord of hosts, creator of all, for in your foresight and compassion you promised to send your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to bear our sins and be our Savior. With your Holy Spirit's gift of faith, we rely in your presence always and rejoice to receive your Son as he comes to us in this holy sacrament. Preserve us in confident faith, without fear of the world, Satan, or our sinful flesh. Grant us the assurance that you are both with us and for us each day, so that we freely serve you until we see you face to face in eternity. To you alone be all the glory and honor, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to him, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
please stand. This true body and blood strengthen you and preserve you until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, Let us pray. You alone, O Lord, are righteous in all your ways. We thank and praise you for the gift of Christ's perfect righteousness given to us in this holy sacrament. What we could never do for ourselves, you have done for us in Christ. Send us into the world with renewed hearts, ready to serve our neighbors with the love you have first shown us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing for our final hymn, hymn um, 863, A Mighty Fortress. <laughs> You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome again to St. 
John's here. Just a special thank you to our choir and our organist, Michaela, for all of the music that they prepared for today, um, for this special uh, music service. There were things that Michaela was doing that just kind of boggles my mind a little bit up there. So thank you. Um, also, thank you to everyone who helped out in one way or another with the Fall Fest yesterday. It was just an awesome time together. Um, so thank you for um, whether you donated your time or, or money or candy, um, whatever it was, thank you very much. And thank you also to the Karlovskis. If you see them in passing at some point, give them a special thank you and um, maybe some extra prayers of, of, of rest after all of that as well. Um, just a little bit of call news, just a, or not necessarily news, but a continued prayer for St. John's and for two people in particular, uh, Mr. Aaron Trimmer, who is our current seventh grade teacher. He's here with a one-year call, um, but his call was, that was issued was for a permanent call. And then also Mr. Glenn Metzger, who was called to be an upper grade teacher. So please keep them in your prayers and keep St. John's in your prayers. Um, and then as you probably have seen some of the artwork out there, Coach Meyer is here today. Good morning, St. John's. All right. I am Coach Lance Meyer. For those of you who don't know me, I am with A City for God and Grass Ministries. And... Uh, Pastor, I want to just thank you for all six points, but uh, number six, I took notes on today, and it says, God gives us opportunities we never, ever thought possible, and I'm standing here today, so if you know my story, I was also in the uh, Born Christ, so you may have seen that article, and we at A City for God have been so, so blessed uh, by people like Eric Goldschmidt, one of your people here who started, who came up with our logo. You can see it up on my hat here if I get rid of my Green Bay Packers sunglasses. And uh, he's designed that, and he's one of the people that also uh, came up with the, and led us into 25 ministries within A City for God, truly A City for God. So I've been blessed this last work, the last two weeks with another one of your partners, uh, Jamel Hargraves. We baptized, or he baptized 18 young people at a very at one of our school or a couple different schools and in 50, in 48 hours we had 56 baptisms with another with another uh, one of our chaplains so God is on the move here in Milwaukee we're so blessed um, praise God for that um, we have in the hallway here about 1500 pieces of art since the last time I talked to you I've done about 700 paintings one of was yesterday this beautiful piece right here at your chapel so give us uh, take a little time and, and just pop around there a little bit I want to take just a moment guys there's a lot of people in our city right now that are really struggle with mental illness uh, my illness is called Hashimoto's encephalitis in fact they're having a conference in Cleveland right now as we speak we also want to pray for Jamel Hargraves and, and the uh, chaplains are going to be leaving a service today at 10 o'clock uh, new launch uh, at Granville Lutheran. So we just go to our God. Lord God, we just thank you for today. Thank you for the 1,440 minutes that you've given to us. Help us to give it to you and to live to your glory. Lord, we lift up Jamel and our many chaplains who are reaching in our city and reaching out with those words. Jesus died for me. Amen. God bless you today. Thank you for your time. Well, we don't have Bible class today. We just have a fellowship time, so enjoy the time just to, um, looking at all the artwork and um, each other's company. And uh, just a, a reminder today that we can be courageous in our witness because ultimately we have the victory. God's blessings. Just take a minute to greet the people around you, and I hope to see you out there. <laughs> 